Yes, folks, already running a little bit late. Sorry about that, but that's just the way things go when you're hustling and running the errands here and there and everywhere in the world. And actually was doing some work over there at the Measurement Incorporated earlier today as well. But I did try to hustle here and get here by two o'clock. Did not quite make it in the time that I wanted. Got here a few minutes late. But, you know, a lot of things are going on in the world. A lot of things that people are paying attention to, whether that's some of the uh, madness that went on this past weekend or whether that's just folks dealing with the, the coronavirus and, of course, folks trying to deal with their economy and all of that. So a lot of folks are definitely paying attention to many things that are going on in the world. And I've got some amazing guests already waiting in the studio to have conversations with us and to talk about the various things that they're involved in as well. And I know that one of them is all about positivity, and we know that we need some positivity in this world at this time. So I'll bring in my amazing guests since they were patient enough to wait for me and all of that, and I'll bring them in so that they can tell a little bit about themselves, and we'll have some great conversation all the way up until about the 3.30 or 4 o'clock hour. But let's bring in my first guest, even though I've got a few more that I want to bring in as well, but I'm going to bring in the first guest and see what they've got to say about the world and what's going on in the We do know that a lot of things are happening in the world, and we need some great conversations happening in that regard. So we've got LJ Thomas, and she's all about being purely positive and all of that. So we know that we need some positivity in the world at this day and time that we are existing and all of that along those lines. So LJ, glad that you were able to make it here. And like I said, I've got some other guests that we'll be joining in conversation with as well. But definitely tell the uh, listeners of IBM TV, the international broadcast media, about yourself. And of course, we are a worldwide network have uh, folks in Australia, folks in uh, Malaysia, and a number of other places that are watching on a regular basis. So I'm sure that folks would love to learn more about LJ Thomas. And then, like I said, I've got Amy Peck and Patrice Neal that will be joining in conversation as well with us later on. But I just wanted to bring you in before bringing them in and let's have this great conversation. So LJ, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, as you know, LJ Thomas is my name. My show is called Purely Positive Show. It is on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, where, social media is where it is. What we do is we spotlight positive people doing positive things for a positive community. So basically, we give people an opportunity to expose the rest of the world to the things that they're doing to give back to make the world a better place. Um, I started this because my husband came home one day and I was crying after watching the news and... Uh, said I couldn't watch the news anymore. I was a little upset about that. But <laughs> it prompted me because he has um, a background in digital um, filmmaking. It prompted me to do something, my little small way of trying to help everybody else. It made me feel good to be able to spotlight positive people. So that's what I do. It's great. We definitely need folks uh, spotlighting positive people on a regular basis. I'd love to hear some of the positive people that you spotlighted, and of course, we'll get into that conversation. But I do want to bring in some of my other guests as well so they can tell a little bit about themselves also, and then we'll just get into a nice roundtable discussion on a number of things. So I'm going to bring in Patrice Neal as well. So, Patrice, uh, I've got you in here as well. So if you would, tell a little bit about yourself. LJ has talked about how she is all about positivity and the need for positive. Uh, messages out there. So I'd love to hear a little bit about you and then I'll bring Amy Peck into the conversation as well. And then we'll just have like a whole dialogue around a number of things, but tell folks a little bit about yourself, Miss Neal. Sounds great. First of all, it's Patrice Nelly. Um, Nelly. And that, that mistakes happens often. So no worries. Um, I am executive director of Children's Flight of Hope. We're headquartered here in the Triangle uh, area of North Carolina, but we serve children across the country and internationally. And what we do is make sure that kids who are in medical and financial need have access to specialized medical care by providing the air transportation that need, they need to get to that care. So it's um, these are children facing very serious, often, you know, life critical um, illnesses. And we fly them to the best doctor that they can find to have the best chance of hope and healing. Sounds like there's some great work that is definitely needed. I know that I live not that far from the uh, Duke Hospital, so oftentimes we'll hear the life flight uh, exactly. helicopter taking off on a regular basis because I'm not that far um, and where 
in terms of where I live. So oftentimes right. we'll see those helicopters taking off and I know that that is some great work that is needed. I imagine that you're having even a lot more work in this age that we're in. We're in the middle of this crazy pandemic that's going on and everything. So I imagine that that's definitely been impacting. And I know a lot of times folks are thinking that kids aren't necessarily impacted by the pandemic because a lot of times we're thinking that it's more of the elderly citizens and some of the other target groups. But we do know that kids can carry the virus and we also do know that they can carry it back to their family members as well so we do need to be concerned okay. about what's going on with our kids even though they may not be the uh the bigger population of who's been impacted but it has impacted right. some kids as well so if you could talk a little bit about um how you've been dealing with um even doing the care at this time when so much sure. of our hospital time is taken up by uh what's going on with the pandemic Exactly. So our children are very um, compromised, obviously, with their health. So COVID um, has been a big factor in their care. Um, the most severely uh, ill or injured of our children have continued to fly. Um, of course, you know, back in April, we only did a couple of flights and we've had a steady increase uh, where there were, you know, previous months where we were doing 90 flights. Um, so they, you know, they are very immune compromised, so traveling commercially has been a challenge for some of them. Um, the big factor in their care, quite honestly, Mark, has been the hospitals being able to receive them. So our children uh, are going to, you know, the best hospitals in our country, Boston's Children's and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and as is, has been the case with, you know, Duke, um, they have been closed to a lot of procedures and a lot of treatments, um, especially when they were in the, the throes of uh, COVID response. So from our family's perspective, it's hit them with regard to concern for their child's travel, uh, limitations in receiving the care. And you know we've accepted 30 new families into our family just since the 1st of, Ju 1st of July, because you have fam more families in financial hardship due to COVID. Um, so we do require medical and financial need verification uh, to make sure we're properly using, you know, the resources that our donors are kind enough to give to us. Um, and like I said, you know, the need is greater because, you know, more families are in financial hardship. Yep, definitely. We know that a lot of those families are in financial hardship, like you said, and that's definitely something that's pressing a lot of folks and everything. I did want to bring in my other guest so she could talk a little bit about what she's got going on. And then I wanted to start, learn from all of y'all how you were coping with what's going on in uh, all of the different things that we are going through, whether it's uh, the political landscape, the COVID landscape, or a number of other landscapes that are going on. But I will definitely bring in uh, Amy into the conversation as well so that we can learn more about what Amy's got going on as well. Amy, glad that you were able to join us and talk a little bit about what you've got going on and all of that. So definitely, if you could share with the uh, other ladies on the uh, call with me and everything, who uh, a little bit about your background and things of that nature, and then we'll get into like a whole general conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much, Mark. Yes, so my name is Amy Peck. My company is Endeavor VR. Um, I work with large companies on leveraging immersive technology. So that's um, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, mixed reality. Uh, there's even another term called XR, which is kind of the umbrella term for all of the realities. Um, but I spend a lot of my own personal time kind of traveling around the world talking about really how technology can just make our lives better. There's a lot of fear about how technology can take people's jobs and, you know, that that people are going to be sidelined. But we can use technology to help fundamentally help people. So even, you know, with some of Patrice's children, for example, you can use virtual reality for pain mitigation therapy. And we've had tremendous results um, with that. So there's, you know, myriad use cases on this sort of topic of, you know, how can we positively impact our lives? Oh, did we lose Mark? We may have I'll lost think. Mark for a minute. We may have lost Mark. We <laughs> <laughs> lose Mark, he's gonna be coming back in. Yeah, so that's that's sort of the, the kind of primary focus, um, but we have all kinds of use cases around um, using virtual reality for training, for example, 
Um, so with that fear of you know people losing their jobs, we have the opportunity to kind of reskill, retrain for the new jobs because all of this technology is also going to create new and different types of jobs. So that's kind of the goal. Uh, but I'd love to hear LJ a, a little bit more about um, also some of your work because I, I I missed the very 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 beginning. <laughs> okay, um, I am. I have a show on Facebook or social media in general where we spotlight positive people doing positive things for a positive community. And in essence, we just um, give some exposure to people who are giving back to the community, whether they're cooking food for the homeless or if they're um, taking care of elderly people or if they have an organization that they're working with, whatever it is in whatever capacity it is that they're doing something to help other people, then that's where we come in to find out about them. We have them on the show, give them some exposure and give people the opportunity to not only see what it is that they're doing and hear about it, but also give them the opportunity to help out. If they need donors or sponsors or if they need volunteers, then naturally those things are addressed during the show. Well, um, Patrice, uh, Nelly, and everything, what have been some of the uh, more uh, amazing stories that you have had with these children? Because I imagine that you've had some really amazing stories with some of the children that you've rescued. And I'd love to hear some of these amazing stories because I'm definitely, I have two nephews. They are um, 11 and 12. And so I definitely have a soft spot in my heart for kids and everything, even though I don't have any kids of my own, but definitely have a soft spot for kids and have a number of friends with kids as well. So I know a lot of times we think about uh, we want kids to always be healthy all the time, but unfortunately that's not the reality. They do get sick. We often face a lot of uh, devastating diseases sometimes even. So I'd love to hear some of the stories that you can share about some of those amazing success stories that you've had. Wonderful. And, you know, the words of gratitude that we get from our parents and our families, Mark, I mean, it just, it, it, it drives you to do more. It motivates you to get up every day. It gives us the honor of feeling like this is a calling and not a job. Um, so those words of appreciation, just, you know, to have parents say, you know, you've saved us from having to sell our home. You know, because of you, when we go to treatment, we have a home to come home to. Um, that's just amazing. Um, so one story, you know, and I was, uh, I talked to our staff and we've got an incredible board of directors. Um, you know, we all get pulled into different stories, different stories kind of grab us more. And, and one that's caught me um, is a little girl named Julia. She lives in Milwaukee. She has retinoblastoma, so eye cancer. She has lost all of her vision in one eye and she uh, has 30% vision in the other eye. And she has been traveling to Memorial Sloan Kettering with us. We have flown her 78 times from Milwaukee to New York for treatment. And this fall for the first time, she is in remission. And this little girl um, just learned to ride her bike. She didn't want anything to do with training wheels. Um, she went to school and the teachers tried to give her special treatment and wanted her to use a cane and she wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, so her positive spirit uh, just really speaks to me. Um, we have a young gentleman who we actually uh, highlighted his story with our donors in 2014. Um, and we just reconnected with him. Uh, he had neuroblastoma. At one time, he had a 10% chance of living. Uh, he has now been in remission for several years. He graduated from high school last June and sent us a very nice thank you note and graduation note um, for helping him get to that milestone. Um, he's now in culinary school and he's doing great and he's healthy. Um, and I think about him lately because we have a family, actually a Raleigh family, who has a little boy, I believe he's four now, who has the same diagnosis, is flying to Memorial Sloan Kettering with us. And he, I got an email from his father a few days after Christmas saying he just had a clean scan for the first time and what a Christmas miracle it was for them. Um, you know, and, you know, we do have children who, who, you know, are facing terminal illnesses and, 
you know, sometimes we can't give them a cure, but we can give them hope. We can give them time. Um, we have a wonderful family that has two children who have flown with us. Their 12 year old son has one diagnosis and, uh, you know, he, he is, it's hard. Um, and they have a little girl who had a different diagnosis and passed away when she was three. And these parents have the most amazing spirit. And if they can have an amazing spirit and to, to LJ's point, find positivity in their life, then everything we do has, has meaning. And, you know, none of us have any right to complain. (laughs) Um, And, and so the, the stories every day, even the stories of sadness and sorrow motivate us. And um, of course we, we love when our kids are healthy and we get those graduation announcements um, and they send us smiling pictures. Um, But but these parents really teach, teach us perspective because we don't need to sweat the small stuff. That's very true. That's actually one of my favorite books is the whole book about not sweating the small stuff. And I try to live by that mantra and all of that. Where is one of the furthest places that you have flown your uh, folks to? Like I said, you fly them all over the country, but we are a global network. And I imagine you even yeah. had to fly them to places even overseas or overseas to here. So what's yeah, the we do. Um, we served 23 countries last year. A lot of those countries are Central America and South America. Um, but, but we have on occasion flown kids from much further. Um, we actually had a little boy come from Columbia who came, uh, went to Shriners in Cincinnati with us in February, and then COVID happened and the border shut down. Um, and it took him and he and his mom until November um, to be able to get home uh, be, because of COVID. Um, but the good news is while he was in Cincinnati for that extended period of time, he received more treatment and more procedures than he had originally planned to do. Um, so they, they found positivity in that too. Definitely a lot of positivity in that. There's no doubt about that. Um, LJ, if you could share, and then I want to get to Amy as well, but if you could share some of the positive stories that you've had the pleasure of covering in the uh, Facebook Live and in the other things that you've done, because I imagine you've got some amazing stories that you've had the pleasure of conversating with. I do. Um, my favorite is a, uh, there's a gentleman who lives in Nigeria, who lives in Lagos, Nigeria. His name is Arizi Idara, but he works with Spell Africa. And he is the, um, I think he's the director of a project which is called B2S Adult Literacy, which means back to school adult literacy. And he's the head of this project because there are over 65 million illiterate people in the country of Nigeria. And because of um, him witnessing firsthand the transformation of a person who is not able to read as opposed to a person who can, which happened to be a family member, his mother, as a matter of fact, um, he took this initiative on and he decided to work with them. And he's been doing that. He has a school where he teaches adults and young ones how to read. The enthusiasm of these people as they are learning to read so that they can get out of poverty. That's one of the main focuses. He even teaches them how to start businesses, you know, so that they can support themselves. All of that stemmed from him wanting to help people learn how to read. And I just interviewed him on the show last week. No, the show just actually aired on Saturday. And I love doing it because this is the kind of stuff. I'm just a bucket of water. This is the kind of stuff that makes me cry. Um, I get so happy when I see it. And it's a huge thing that he's doing. He gave us a tour of the school. He came back and he told us what's happening with COVID and everything. It's amazing. It's just amazing. But he's my favorite. There's so many more. He's my favorite. Wow, that sounds like an amazing story. Amy, we know a lot of folks are definitely paying attention to virtual reality and to uh, ways of teachers actually trying to use these different platforms in order to help our kids and things of that nature. So I'd love to hear you share a little bit about how that's working in your field and everything, because I do know that a number of schools, whether they're college, whether they're high schools, are doing this hybrid learning kind of 
atmosphere where they're incorporating both of uh, the regular computer and uh, the things that we're used to, whether that's Zoom, whether that StreamYard, but also they're incorporating things like virtual reality and AR into their coursework if they can. So I'd love to hear you share a little bit about what you're seeing happening in the education front. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly just on its kind of core level, you know, things you learn in uh, a virtual environment, um, it, you know, there's there's numbers like 30% higher retention. Um, kids are far more engaged. Uh, but but then we sort of look at at kids who are on the spectrum or have special needs. And there was a study done in in Spain a few years ago uh, where they they put children who have are afflicted with Asperger's into virtual environments. And one of the the, the common challenges, um, you know, for for kids with Asperger's is sort of socially engaging with other children, um, understanding cues. But they also have a have a challenge kind of looking kids direct or people in general sort of directly in the eye. And so what they were able to do was have these children practice, you know, sort of social skills and ways to kind of navigate social environments in virtual environments. And one of the th interesting things they found is that though they were working with avatars, which was a real therapist, but sort of appeared as an avatar in the virtual environment, uh, the children were actually able to look the avatar in the eye. So that was sort of the first thing. And then the second thing is they were really able to learn those sort of social cues so that they could go back out into the real world and have much more successful relationships. And if you think about some of the impact uh, of, of any kind of negative interaction when kids are young, that stays with them for a very long time. I mean, even just the fact that they get a label of special needs. You know, that's something they wear through their lives. And, you know, for me in the bigger picture, if we look at, um, this is just scratching the surface of what the technology can do. Um, we can change the belief systems of children. And, and that instead of instilling these labels and trying to put them in boxes, that we sort of enable their natural abilities and they can go into virtual learning environments and learn the way they're meant to because our schools are quite linear, right? And they mm -hmm. teach to a particular type of student. And for that type of student, it's very effective. But children have very, very different learning styles, very, very different skill sets. And this is a way for them to be able to learn the way they were meant to learn. So those are some of the few kind of success stories that we're seeing. Yeah, some amazing success stories. And one of the things that you, as you were saying that, that crossed my mind is I know that with all the turmoil that happened the last week and everything, I've got a number of friends that were talking about the impact that that had on their kids and everything. And they were trying to like have the kids understand um, if anybody could understand what happened last week, but try to get it at least uh, some sense of what was going on and th their understanding of it. So I was wondering, uh, Patrice, did you have any dealings with that in terms of like the hospital and the way of the kids trying to identify what was happening last week there on Capitol Hill? Because I know that a good friend of mine, Sri Srinivasan, who does a show similar to this, um, his business partner was talking about how he tried to explain it to his, I think, six and eight year old daughter and everything. So I know a number of folks are trying to identify a lot of the things that we're going through. And it's not just the um, incident that happened in Capitol Hill, but also the pandemic and a number of other things that kids may not be able to understand on a natural level. So I was just wondering how you're dealing with that when you're talking to the kids that you're, um, so, you know, one of the, um, one of the limitations that we have is, you know, we don't uh, interact face to face with a lot of our children because they're across the country and internationally. Right. We do have um, quite a few that we serve in our area, but again, with them being immune compromised, we're not having face to face contact with them right now. But I do think that, um, you know, COVID and the recent events, um, that are, are challenging our country overall. And it's not just last week, it was, you know, uh, the conversations last spring um, as well. It just shows how important um, the positivity and the hope and the healing is. And so, you know, I can just speak to what we are and what we are doing. Right. And that is to show compassion and ease the burden 
for families who are in the fight of their lives and to give them hope and to give them healing. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know what conversations they're having with our kids, but if we can be a light in that darkness, then that's what we're all about. No, definitely. And I've actually seen some very interesting conversations that have happened even using VR and uh, AR and things of that nature. Amy, I remember I had a friend of mine that was involved in one of these conferences here, and I think it maybe it was uh, last year or the year before. So it was definitely before the pandemic started and everything. And they had a whole discussion around um, what women go through in terms of like women that are being abused and things of that nature, but they were actually using VR and AR kind of technology. So that folks have had a better understanding of what people are going through. And I was just wondering your thoughts about that. Cause like I said, I know that when I looked at that uh, VR helmet and they showed a couple of the things, it was um, definitely eye opening. That's the best way I can put it. It was very eye opening what you got to see in that kind of experience. Yeah, it, uh, VR is is kind of called um, the the empathy machine, and you know instead of us sort of looking at videos of some of the challenges that maybe people have had, this actually gives you the opportunity to put yourself in their shoes. There's um, right. a, a, a beautiful VR piece called Clouds Over Sidra, which follows a young girl, um, you know, in in a refugee camp. And it's, it's, it's actually from her perspective. So you're actually kind of low to the ground as well. And, and you sort of move through this experience. And, you know, even sort of following on, you know, with, with some of the things that Patrice said and, and uh, that you mentioned how challenging it is to really articulate. But this was a way for all of us to kind of understand what it was like. And, you know, when we look at what the pandemic has done, in, in some regards, it's a, it's forced us to, as a, as a global village, to stand shoulder to shoulder against a common enemy. But what's remarkable is that we don't do that in a positive light and in a proactive light in general. And I think that there's a, a role uh, for VR in these virtual environments, starting with schools and, and having global classrooms so that you might be paired with children from 10 different countries and working on projects together and going into these virtual environments because that's going to engender a general understanding of another culture, another race. And so we can stop some of this madness that's going on that we're seeing you know, in this country and all over the world. Um, and, and that's to me kind of the, the bigger vision and, and the big opportunity here with this technology. Yeah, because I know one of the founders here on the network, that being Kim Calhoun, as well as um, Nick uh, Palveda, who's another one of the founders, they often talk about the feeling that they have that, unfortunately, in terms of education, that we're using 18th century techniques in the 21st century. So I was wondering if y'all would agree with that and how you would uh, think about that from an educational standpoint, because they feel that we're not necessarily doing enough educational wise and that we've actually gotten away from some of the things that we used to do educationally. Like I remember when I was in school and I was in the uh, 70s that I was in grade school and everything that I remember folks taking like um, vocational courses, which they don't have as much as now. And I remember there being more emphasis on like some of the creative arts and things of that nature, which we've seemed to have pulled away from and a lot of other kinds of fields along that line. But I was just wondering, y'all thoughts about where we are in terms of developing some of these two techniques. So I, was, I guess I'll start with you, Amy, and then go to you, Patrice, and then come up to LJ. But do you feel that we're actually incorporating enough of the computer technology into our day-to-day -day lives and into our education? Well, you said something that was, that was interesting. You know, we're very focused on STEM education. Which, which is good. I mean, I've seen a, a much kind of bigger push towards STEM education in schools and also to kind of bridge that gender gap and, and not kind of push young girls out of the sort of, you know, engineering, science, math fields and sort of you know, encourage them. Um, but the arts is a big piece of this. And so the, it's interesting that I, it, it should be STEAM, right? It should be STEM with including the arts because when we talk about, I think while you dropped, dropped off a little bit, um, I had mentioned that, that you know, there is this fear uh, around how technology is potentially going to be displacing jobs. And we can certainly leverage technology to retrain for the new jobs, but really at our core, how we sort of survive as you know, humans in this technological age is our ability to create. And so 
I think it's really important for us to bring the arts back into schools. They're you know, largely underfunded as well. Um, and that's one of the challenges. But, you know, our, our, you know when we're kids, we, we can do anything. You know, we come up with these fantastical ideas, right? And they don't, they're not always based in reality, but we have that systematically drummed out of us throughout the school years because we need to fit into this kind of box to be functional in society. But what we're forgetting is society has changed so dramatically and, and that sort of ability to create this sort of disparate thinking, this broad moonshot thinking is the thing that's going to help propel us and, and bring us answers to some of our most pressing challenges of which there are many on a global level. So again, I know I speak in these very kind of, you know, big kind of, you know, futuristic terms, but if we don't start today in thinking about how we do everything and especially education because education is at the core of it uh, you know we're going to ha really have our fears are going to be realized right uh, but we're still in control of this technology today so you know i think it's all of our responsibility to to learn and to change and that comes back to something that I was going to ask Patrice as well. Uh, one where you always one that felt that you would be in the medical field all your life and all of that nature. That was one of the original questions I was going to ask. But along those same lines, we're seeing so many of our medical folks from uh, you know the frontline workers definitely getting a lot of recognition and rightfully so because they are at the for forefront of the battle that we're in the middle of with this pandemic and all of that. My fear, though, and I was wondering your thoughts on this as well, is that they definitely are seen as the heroes that they are now, just as teachers are seen as the heroes that they should be and have always should have been, in my opinion. I've got teachers in my family, uh, some that have passed on and some that are still involved in the, the uh, teaching profession. But sometimes when we have these moments, they become like, um, I hate to put it, but they become kind of faddish. So they become very much in the need that we need to have them now. So because we need to have them now, they are at the forefront, but I'm still not feeling that we're, necessarily giving them the right rewards that they deserve, meaning our medical professionals and all of that. So I'm afraid that once the pandemic is past us, that we may go back to the old ways of not treating our, particularly the nurses and the orderlies and some of the other frontline workers with the kind of respect that we're showing them now. So I was just wondering if that's something that you are concerned about as well. And then, like I said, did you always think that you wanted to be in the medical field? You know, I, I can't predict the future, obviously, but I do think we we have been in unprecedented times, right? We all know that these last 10 months. Um, and, you know, we've all had hardship and challenges, personal, professional, whatever it is in our life. And, you know, I should be I should be working with LJ here um, because if we go through those experiences and we don't come out better people, then what a waste it was. Um, and so. You know, I have to believe even in this dark world that we've had the last 10 months that that the positive will come from it every day. You look at the news and you wonder if it really will. Um, but um, I have to I have to believe that we are going to take some lessons from this uh, that will carry us forward in a better place. I think we have a lot of healing to do, um, but I hope we get there, um, you know, and and. As far as, you know, medical field, um, I have, you know, my passion is nonprofit. I've stepped out a nonprofit um, before and, and I've wondered every time, why did I do that? Because this is what really, you know, calls to me. Um, I worked in a nonprofit that was, was focused on children for quite a while. And then I focused, at, I worked at one that was focused on healthcare. So when this opportunity came along, um, and it's a combination of those two things that I love so much. It was it's the perfect fit. Yeah, before I get to LJ's uh, question, I'll get ready to ask her and everything. I hate to tell you this, Patrice, but once you get into it's kind of like the arts. Once you get into the nonprofit world, I'm convinced that you're kind of like stuck in there and that you'll be in there forever because I've observed this from my mom and the others that I have known in the, the nonprofit world because I've definitely worked at the Hate Heritage Center, which is a artistic nonprofit as well as being on the board of the Carolina Theater and my uh Mom was actually the first director of the Golden Leaf Foundation. So Valeria Lee is my mother and everything. So definitely she still seems to be very much involved in terms of like being active in the nonprofit world, sometimes just doing more of the consulting kind of thing. So I think she may only serve on one or two boards 
currently yeah. everything, but and she's uh, not quite hit the 80 mark, but it seems like she's always being involved. So like I said, I think the nonprofit is kind of like one of those um, callings that you never quite get out of. So that's just what I have observed for many that have been in that nonprofit world. <laughs> You know, with, with the mission we have and the and the supporters we have and an incredible board of directors, um, this this is this is a good place to be. So um, I'm very I'm very happy to be advocating for this mission and working with the supporters that I do to make the magic happen. Yep, definitely. And though we do know that boards are very important and all of that. Um, with all this going on in the world and everything, LJ, what do you do personally to keep your positivity? Because you definitely have a positive outlook on life and things of that nature. So what do you do in terms of uh, maintaining your positivity? Well, first I would like to address your question about education. Yeah. Um, I want to piggyback on something that Amy said, and she brought out about how um, the arts play a big part. Um, and how they are not as readily used as they have been in the past. Like you, I was in grade school in the 70s. And um, music, all of the arts, you know, whether it's creative writing, whether it's painting, drawing, no matter what it is, dance, no matter what it is, all of those things help play a big part in the creativity of a child. And it helps open that child up to being able to receive the second the education that they're receiving. And I don't think people think about it or even look at it like that. When you're a child and you can go to school and you have the little art time at school, then that kind of relaxes your mind so that you can receive the hard stuff, you know, the science and the English and the math and whatever all that stuff is. So for that reason, I think that like Amy, we need to do more to make sure that we bring those things back. And I'm trying to do everything that I can because I am trying to, well, I'm not trying to, I'm going to. I'm trying to start another show which focuses on bringing exposure to the arts. Um, I'm probably going to do that in the next couple months, but it's because I feel so strongly about that. Now, what do I do to bring positivity to myself? Don't laugh, but I like cartoons. I like Looney Tunes cartoon. <laughs> so when when I'm feeling really down, I the first thing I do is I put in some Tom and Jerry cartoons or Sylvester and Tweety. Those just get me. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, then as I'm watching cartoons, I get out my crayons, Crayola only, and a coloring book, and I color. And if that doesn't work, then I go in the room, close the door, turn music up real loud, and mess up other people's songs. And that's what I do. <laughs> it sounds like a great way to like have some very positive kind of attitudes. I think right. Patrice and Amy were kind of enjoying those thoughts as well. So, um, Patrice, what do you do when you need to have your positive moments? You're dealing with these kids that are oftentimes giving you some sad moments in life. So I know you have to have your moments of relaxation as well. So what do you do to get your feeling of positivity? You know, I have um, I have learned over the years, sometimes I just have to let myself wallow in, in my mood for a little bit. And then I put my rally cap on and come out stronger. Um, so that, uh, that is, you know, one thing I've just learned to just give myself a little time. I don't like to stay down for long. Um, I like all sorts of music, but, um, Christian music really perks up, up my spirit a lot. And I try to make that part of my day, even just driving around. Um, you know, my, I have four grown sons and they're not big fans of, of my music selection sometimes. Um, but it really, it just, it just soothes your soul. Um, so I do like that. And, you know, and, and with work, um, yeah, there, there is sadness. I mean, we have, we have, you know, we, we check obituaries before we send our children birthday cards. You know, that's a sad reality of what we're doing. Um, but the, but the families are so forthcoming with their words of gratitude. Um, the messages we receive, the pictures they send, um, the quotes we get from them. You know, that's all you need to keep going. Gotcha. What about you, Amy? What do you do when you need to have your moment of positivity? Well, definitely, I, I, I definitely am, am with LJ and Patrice with the music. I play very, very loud music. And I um, 
actually have, well, I have now two teenage boys, um, both college age. And so I listen to their music, thankfully. So they don't mind when I'm playing it loud in the car. Um, I also just go for a walk, you know, I'll put on, put on my, um, you know, my Bose glasses, which are AR glasses. So people actually can't even tell they look like regular glasses, but there's very loud music, but you can still hear everything around you. Um, and just, you know, kind of try and go out towards the end of the day and get up in the mountains and watch the sunset. And then of course, VR, I play, um, a couple different games. One's called Beat Saber, which again is a new sort of a music game. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one called Super Hot, which is this sort of beautiful, it's definitely a little violent, it's not for everyone, but it's it's so beautiful because it's in this white room and then there's these very, these crimson sort of ruby red, you know, polygon creatures that come at you and they go at the speed that you do. So as you speed up, they speed up. And as they slow down, you slow down. And so it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very kind of soothing. Um, and then, you know, I'm in California. So I, I started meditating about actually sort of right at the beginning of the pandemic, and I was with a, a, a group, a WhatsApp group. Um, one of my friends invited me to it, and it was for a, a 21 day challenge. And they started, and I thought, wow, this is really good because what LJ said about music, and it's I think it's true of meditation, is you have to stop and kind of get off the hamster wheel and quiet your mind. And I, it, it's there's plenty of data now to support this, but it's I found it now sort of anecdotally from a personal level that when I come back, I'm much more clear. And if I've been in a bad mood, it puts me in a good mood. And it's 10, 10 I think it's 12 minutes, these sessions. You know, so it's not a lot of time. Um, so yeah, so those are a few different things. Well, and um, Patrice, you mentioned the importance, and I'd love to hear from all of y'all, um, the importance, and I take it different ways because like some people think of it as being <clears throat> excuse me the more Christian kind of viewpoint but to me spirituality and faith is important to a lot of folks on a lot of levels particularly with all that we're going in in this particular world and I mean Amy you've been in California where you're not only dealing with the pandemic but you're also dealing with those fires that have been going on as well so I'd love to hear from all of y'all and that's just one example where there's being folks facing double things going on with the pandemic being the major force. But then like in California's case, there were the fires in the case of Louisiana, there were those severe storms and things that were going on at the same time as the uh, pandemic has been raging around the uh, world and all, but how important is faith, whatever that means to you, to you and everything. And what do you do to have that communication with uh, whatever that faith message is, whether that consider yourself spiritual, religious or whatever. Me first? Yeah. So I think there, um, you know, obviously there's in our personal positions, not those positions of Children's Flight of Hope, right? We're not a political or religious affiliated organization. Um, I think spiritual, spirituality and being religious are very different things. I've known very spiritual, kind people who are not religious, and I know religious people who I don't think are particularly spiritual kind. Um, so I think there's a balance. You know, I was raised with faith being a part of our family. I raised my children that way. Um, and to me, it is um, it is comfort. It is it is uh, loving arms around you, whether you see that in your friends or your family or your God. Um, and who didn't need that in the last 10 months? Um, you know, and, and, you know, Amy talks about going for a walk. I mean, I'd like to just go sit outside on my back deck and, and listen to the birds and feel the quiet. Um, and that is, you know, to me, that's that's spiritual, but it's also, you know, you could say it's religious because it's it's God's nature that we're enjoying. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it's all about taking the time to, as we've mentioned, you know, just appreciate what's around you, um, enjoy the small things um, and that and that keeps you grounded. Yeah, definitely. Um, LJ, what about yourself? Then I'll come to Amy. I am. Um, hmm. I do feel that faith is a huge part of being able to cope with not just this pandemic, but there are some of us who have um, health issues, who have things going on with our families that um, require us to be able to decompress and to use um, a higher power or spirituality to be able to do that. So for me, I feel like um, I couldn't do anything without my faith. I'm just um, 
one of those type of people. I read my Bible, I pray a lot, and then I try to stay as positive as I possibly can. That works for me. It's not for everyone, but it works for me. Gotcha. What about you, Amy? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not a particularly, and my family, we didn't really grow up religious per se, um, which is very much why I really have enjoyed kind of discovering meditation because it, it and, and also being outside and, and being in nature because it, what it does is it, it, it makes me feel part of something bigger. It does, it, it, it brings me to that connection, that connective, whatever it is, you know, what, whatever you want to call the higher power, it, it connects us to that higher power, but more importantly, it connects us to each other, which I think is so important. This has been so isolating and Zoom, it's great to see your faces, um, but it's not the same, right, as that human interaction. And we all, you know, we all crave that. We all need that. And so I, I think that's really what it's done for me. Um, and, and, and also taking that moment just to be grateful for the things we do have. And, you know, we're, we're um, you know, Patrice, you know, lives through terrible stories, but also then these stories of triumph. And it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, your, your ability, Patrice, to, to look at those wonderful stories and, and draw that positivity from it. And I think that's sort of what I'm, I'm learning to do with meditation and, and this sort of newfound spirituality. It's interesting you said that because I was watching, um, it was actually a survey, like one of those test surveys, because unfortunately that's what you wind up doing when you've got a lot of free time on your hand. You wind up doing these different surveys and these different quizzes and all of that. And one of them was what people would most want to have happen um, and what they are looking forward to whenever this pandemic is over. And you actually alluded to it. And the thing that they really want to have come back was the ability to actually see people's faces, not see them through the mask and all of that, and also the ability to hug and to touch folks, because right now we're not seeing enough of that going on in our day-to-day -day lives. And I remember that that was like, I think one and two, and I don't remember which one was one. I think it was the seeing the face was one, and then the hugging was number two. And then there were some other things that were all about touch that folks were seeing is what they wanted it to have happen in the next steps as we move uh, with the vaccine and a number of other things and hopefully are heading into a better space where we'll be able to get back out and do some of the things that we used to do. But even when we go back to those new spaces, it seems like they're going to be uh, done in a new way. Like I'm, I'm imagining, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Amy, that concerts, and I've been in the event planning space, definitely have worked with different theaters and all kinds of things. But I don't know that we're going to see concerts or movies the way that we used to. I'm imagining that they're going to be kind of a mixed braid where it's a combination of what we used to see with the concerts, but maybe there's a hologram of the performer or maybe there's a virtual reality kind of thing. But it's not quite the old-fashioned kind of concert that we were used to. But do you think that we'll go back to seeing concerts in the more traditional method or will it be kind of this mixed hybrid that I think education is also moving towards? No, I think you're right. I think it's definitely this hybrid and we've seen it with um, Travis Scott did uh, a, a concert in um, in Fortnite. Uh, we saw The Weeknd performed in TikTok uh, and John Legend did a great um, dance, uh, dance-a-thon sort of fundraiser um, actually in VR in alt space. And so, you know, this the, the pandemic has really sort of fast-tracked a search for what is that new kind of entertainment paradigm. And what's really interesting is that, you know, when you go into a virtual environment, you could have an artist just sitting on a, in a black box on a chair, you know, playing a guitar, singing, and every single person experiencing that could, could have an experience of one-to-one -one with that artist if they wanted to, or they could turn on the audience and have a shared experience with the audience. So this, it's really opened up a new realm and we're starting to see this whole idea of social media, gaming and entertainment is just merging and how that will evolve is going to be very, very interesting over time. But I think you're right. I don't think we're going back to that sort of traditional, let's all like trudge to the stadium and watch our favorite band, you know, mostly on the screens. Right. Cause I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not the, getting the backstage passes and sitting in the front row. I'm in the nosebleeds somewhere watching it on the screen. 
Um, so for that, you know, VR is a is a is a great opportunity to have that like real connection with an artist. Yeah, because uh, it, it is a great connection. I've still not quite got with, and I am a sports fan, I'm still not quite getting with the cutouts and the video versions of people watching the uh, games from elsewhere while the players are playing. So I still want to have that fan interaction with the players and all of that. So I'm hoping that that would come back. But I'm also hearing that there's going to be like some testing kind of VR kind of things going on as well, where they will test to make sure that the people are um, – you know, safe in terms of being vaccinated and things of that nature before they let them in to the auditorium or the big arenas and things along that line. So, Amy, have you heard about these kind of things or do you think that we're going to be stuck in that world as well where I'm going to have to get used to cutouts at a baseball game and the TV screen <laughs> and everything well, when I'm watching the football match? I think that's going to change a little bit as well. And there's some interesting augmented reality um, technology that's that's being overlaid into those experiences where you could actually use your mobile device now, but eventually there'll be, you know, we're going to have these magic wayfarers in a few years that sort of project everything. Um, but you could actually watch an instant replay with them as little 3D characters on your living room table, you know, on your coffee table. Uh, and so there's definitely sort of playing with with that aspect of it. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of augmented reality experiences with players off the field. So, for example, you could, you know, with your glasses or your mobile device, watch, you know, uh, I don't know, the Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry, uh, you know, on actually in the basketball you know, area that you're where you're playing basketball with your friends. Um, and then once we're able to go back. Um, you know, again, we're going to have to probably be every other seat or every third seat for the foreseeable future. Um, I think there are going to be some interactive pieces so that we feel a little bit more connected. But it's going to be a long while, I think, before we're really like en masse, in, you know, in these in these big arenas, because there's still going to be risk factors and COVID's not going away. It's going to be, you know, sort of an every year threat as it mutates every year. And mm -hmm. You know, according to some of the the um, uh, pieces I've read, um, you know, it'll be similar to the flu where we have to get inoculated every year, where it's going to mutate every year. There'll be a different version of it. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to to really take a, a long, hard look about, you know, how we can leverage technology to still have these same kind of you know interactive experiences. Now, one of the things I want to come back to Patrice as well, one of the things that I've really been fascinated by and it actually comes back to our kids and everything, is I'm, I'm actually finding that the kids may actually be doing a better job in the sense of both understanding some degree, and I know this may contradict what I asked earlier, but, but to some degree, it seems like they're doing a better job of processing some of the things and also doing a better job of like um, having a better global understanding. I've got a good friend of mine that actually does another one of our shows here on this network called Funk Music with Zach. He also used to do one called um, Funk from the Front Seat, but he's got two uh, teenage um, kids and everything. One of them, I think one is a musician, one is more of an athlete and all of that. But he's oftentimes talking about how um, they seem to be more accepting of a number of things. So like they don't seem to be as concerned about uh, people's orientations, people's race differences and things of that nature. So it seems like our this generation of kids coming up seems to be a more understanding kind of community. At least that's what I've observed as well. But I was thinking, have you noticed that in your dealing with kids that they seem to be more understanding and more accepting the 21st century children that are out there? You know, I, I can't really speak to that with, with the children that we serve because it's not conversations that I'm having with them. Um, you know, I certainly hope that the younger generation, you know, is more aware and more accepting. Like I said, I have, you know, four sons in their mid, you know, 20s to early 30s. And I certainly see that with them. Um, but, you know, I really can't I can't speak to how our, the children that we serve feel on that point. Gotcha. That makes sense. What about yourself, uh, LJ? Have you noticed that with kids and everything? Do you think that the kids of today are doing a little bit better than, say, the kids of the 60s and the 70s? Well, actually, I do. I have a nine-year-old grandson who is, um, he's being homeschooled naturally, but he was homeschooled before the pandemic lockdown and everything. And um, it's interesting because he realizes that um, 
as much as he wants to come over and get grandma's chicken noodle soup, he can't. So he FaceTimes me. <laughs> he FaceTimes me three or four times a week and he talks with me because he says, Grandma, I can't come and hug you. I can't sit on your lap and blah, 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 blah. But in that in that scenario, I understand how something has been taken away and he's already processed how to come to terms with it and find a way around it hmm. without there being a huge um, big blow up being made in relationship. I remember as a child, you told me that I wasn't going to be able to do something that my whole world came to an end at nine years old. You know, he's, he's completely the opposite. And I just think that that's amazing. That's what I've actually been been seeing with the kids that I know. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you on that. Patrice, what are some of the things that you, as we've been going through this whole pandemic and everything that's going on, what are some of the things that you miss the most? Like I said, I've kind of missed uh, going, I know, living in Durham, I hated that we didn't have the Durham Bulls last okay. year, which is our minor league baseball team, and I regretted not being able to go to those games and don't know that I'll get to go this year as they haven't made a call yet on minor league baseball. But what are some of the things in life that you are regretting that you wish that you could do more of? Well, on a personal level, I miss concerts and I've got grandchildren too, and they've been on COVID lockdown, so I've hardly seen them. But, you know, the, the professional impact has been significant. Um, I had only been, um, I started at Children's Flight of Hope late last January, so I had only been here for six weeks when, when COVID happened. Um, and, you know, I have a, a really strong network in this area. Um, that I haven't been able to get in front of and have those face-to-face conversations like I want to to share what we're doing. Um, you know, originally when I was hired, the goal was I was going to go into be going to Boston and going to New York and going to these other places to share our story um, and to try to get support from large companies that have a broad geographic uh, reach that matches our broad geographic reach. So I haven't been able to do that, but I have, you know, been very proud of the organization, you know, talking a little bit about the technology. You know, I'm not a technology guru by any stretch, um, but, you know, that that magic word for this past you know year is pivot. Um, and we've done a good job of pivoting to try to keep in touch with donors to to bring in new supporters. Um, we had a virtual event in November, which. You know, originally was like, what? We have to do a virtual event. I don't have no clue how to do that. Um, and it worked. It worked really well. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, we all want to be, to your point, we all want to be having those face to face conversations. I want to be out singing from the rooftop with everybody I know about what a great mission this is. Um, and you, you've got to find a way to work around and make sure we're standing strong in the months, in, you know, to come. Yep. What are some of the things that you're missing, Amy, in terms of like the day to day life and the fact that we're in this pandemic and you're over there in California? So what are some of the things that you're missing? You know, I, I mean, I'm one of those crazy people. I travel about 200,000 miles a year globally, and I, I actually miss that. I, I, I'm, I'm actually traveling. Strangely, I've been able to travel a fair amount, um, but it means I also have to get tested as soon as I land. <laughs> um, but we had also just launched uh, a global uh, women's program called Prospera Women, which is uh, designed to help female entrepreneurs in emerging markets, um, you know, kind of build, help them build their companies, help them find funding. And that sort of all came to a screeching halt. Uh, the good news is it's um, back on and we're launching our first cohort um, February 1st. Do you like how I was able to, to like move that question into a plug for this program? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it is, and, and it's something, you know, I really care a lot about. And, um, you know, we have to support women here in this country, but we have to support women around the world. And so we're launching our first cohort February 1st. It's a six month program. We have 10 women who are sponsored. And so I'm traveling to um, uh, Tbilisi in the country of Georgia to do the launch program and the boot camp. And so, you know, it's sort of this this light at the end of the tunnel where, you know, we we miss these things. I miss hugging my boys and I still do. You know, we turn our faces away like somehow that's protecting us. But it it, it feels odd to be thinking, gosh, I wonder if he's been at a party, you know, as I'm hugging my child. Like that's just 
not the subtext that needs to be going on. And so I'm, I'm really anxious to get back to that just purity of interaction where we're not scared or worried or, you know, this is this very kind of, you know, insidious stress level that's going on. And it just sort of keeps going and keeps going. And uh, I think we'll realize how severe it is when things start to return to normal and we feel this weight lifted. And so I'm looking forward to, to getting there, but in the meantime, doing everything that I can and that we can to just have those little moments with the people we care about. Oh, yeah, no doubt about that. What about yourself, LJ? What are some of the things that you've been missing as well? I have to say I miss cooking for my family. I miss having family dinners. I bought a whole new dining room set, and I haven't had a chance to use it because COVID happened. I miss, um, I like doing karaoke. I miss having little karaoke parties with my friends and family, and I miss being able to grill outside and go to the park and just sit outside and have a good time because unfortunately I am in the vulnerable category for several reasons as far as COVID is concerned. So my exposure to the outside world, world is severely limited. Um, and I hate that I have to go get tested. I have to leave here in a little bit to go get tested again. Um, so I will be ecstatic when all of this is over and we can get back to a little bit of normalcy. Yeah, I agree. Normalcy is definitely something that we're all looking forward to having in all of that. Um, Amy, you mentioned it, and I think Patrice kind of alluded to it and everything, but, um, and that's the fact that there's not enough, um, particularly in the tech world, and I've actually had a couple of guests on a variety of my shows here, but there's not enough women in the tech field, and I would argue there are probably not enough women in the nonprofit world as well. So I'd love to hear you talk about that and how y'all cope with being in that field and trying to bring more women into the respective field. So I'll start with you, Patrice. Do you feel there are enough women doing the kind of nonprofit world work? And if not, how are you helping to encourage others to get involved in the kind of work that you're doing? Yeah. And I actually um, would, would say from my experience and I, and I imagine it changes, you know, geographically um, I find the nonprofit world to be heavily female. Um so, you know, I would argue the flip side, um, you know, our board of directors is definitely more male and, and uh, than female. But from a from the organizations that I've been with, the staff has typically been um, has been more female. Um, and I think it's, you know, to the point, it's kind of seen as a a liberal arts type of field not anything in the STEM world, which could very easily speak to why there's more women in it, because we feel like, you know, you know, if, if you have a good business acumen and you're compassionate and you can share a story, you can be successful in nonprofit. Um, you don't have to um, have the, the STEM, you know, perceived more skilled mindset of engineering, science, technology, engineering and math. Um, so yeah, in my experience, the nonprofit world is um, is is pretty heavy on the female uh, staff leadership. Gotcha. But Mark, as I shared with you when you invited me to do this, unfortunately, I am, am ten minutes past my hard stop. All right. So well, I appreciate you, and I know that uh, LJ's got to bounce as well. One of the things that I always do toward the end of uh, people's being on the show is I always give them the opportunity to give their words of encouragement that they would like to share with our global community. So as you head out the door, I would love to hear your words of encouragement and all of that, because definitely that's something that I believe in is us sharing positivity in whatever way we can. Well, I am going to give a shameless plug for Children's Flight of Hope and encourage everyone um, to think about our children. They need you. Um, we're working hard for them. Um, you know, every donation helps. You can, you know, give $10 a month on our website doing a monthly donation. It all adds up to incredible impact. Um, so, you know, even even follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Children's Flight of Hope. Help us grow our awareness. Um, we're 30 years old this year, actually, but um, a lot of people still don't know about us. And, and we are happy to have your support, and your support can be just sharing the word. 
Definitely sounds like some great work that you're doing and all of that. Um, and could, if you would, if you give the uh, website one more time where folks can reach you and uh, what you consider basically the primary mission of Children of Hope, and then I'll let you slide on out as I said. Fantastic. So it's childrensfightofhope.org. And our basic mission is to provide hope and healing to children by giving them access to medical care through air transportation. Well, I appreciate you being on. You're an amazing guest, and I hopefully can get you back on. I know that we have a number of shows, including some that deal with the medical field. We actually have some shows around Medical Fridays, and there's also some medical shows that are on Mondays and some of the other shows that exist during the course of our uh international broadcast media programming because i know that we've Wonderful. Got- I, would love it. I have enjoyed meeting all of you and uh hearing more about your stories and and best to you let's stay positive and and uh tackle a, a great year ahead of us sounds great thank you Thanks so much yeah what about you amy what is your thoughts about that in the sense of the uh field where it exists in terms of i do know that there are not enough women in the stem field i've had the pleasure of having uh um, Stephanie SB on who has a program called Gems, which is trying to get more women and minorities to be specific into the whole uh, STEM kind of fields and everything. So I do think that there is a shortage of women in those fields. And I've also, one of the other shows we do is a show called The Gamers Den, which is about the video game industry. And we talk about the fact that there's not enough women in that field as well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we can do. Well, to I've, get got more. Some, I've got some, some great guests for you, some female guests for you, for your gamer realms. I'll have you make those introductions. We're, we're actually pretty fortunate that in the XR field, um, there are a lot of women and, and it's changing. It's not enough. I've been doing a talk um, actually since, uh, and not to bring up something negative, but since the whole kind of hashtag me too movement, um, and in answer to that, it's called um, hashtag me plus three. And what that is, is instead of just thinking to yourself, yes, we need to help women, it's identify the three women in your immediate circle who you can help, who you can actually just put a hand out to um, and, and you know change some piece of their path. Um, and it could be as simple as an introduction to someone in your network. It can be an offer to mentor. Um, we have the ability to really impact other people's lives if we just take a moment and ask. Um, so I would urge anyone who's out there, um, you know, reach out to me. I get I have had a 14-year-old girl reach out to me on LinkedIn with some challenges with XR, and I'm having her on my podcast so she can kind of talk about what she wants to do in the future. Um, and so I do answer those. Uh, and also, please check out Prospera Women. It's P R O S P E R A women. Uh, and it, you know, we are actively seeking entrepreneurs, if you are a mentor, and it's not just for women, we, you know, we need, we need help from men, this is a community. Um, we, we just, you know, there's a, definitely a, a spot for you, whether you're an entrepreneur or an advisor or an investor. Uh, and, and like I said, please reach out to me on LinkedIn, if I personally can be of help to you in any way. Because I know there have been some great women that are doing stuff in the entrepreneurial field here, even in Durham. I'm good friends with a young lady named Jess Everhart who does this whole thing called Reinvent and Reimagine. So she's actually been getting a lot of folks to kind of reimagine the ways that the fields that they want to go into and just kind of like reinvent themselves as well. Because we do know that a lot of us, um, and you, I think, had alluded to that word, pivoting. We are finding this to be a time to kind of reinvent ourselves. I mean, this network literally started out of the pandemic because I think that uh, Kim and uh, Nick were hearing a lot of stories of what was going on before it hit the, the United States from other countries. And they were like starting to wanted to do regular reporting about what was going on. So they started doing a daily thing that started back in March and this coming March will be a year of the uh, network being around and all of that. And they are now expanding, bringing on new shows and trying to like make it into a more uh, extensive kind of network. So definitely I know that it came out of that whole pivoting aspect, but I think that we're seeing that with a lot of things where folks are at home and are finding new opportunities and all of that. So um, if you could, Amy, share, share with us a little bit about the podcast, and then I want to hear a little bit about LJ's uh, thing that she's doing as well, because I think she's got a podcast as well, but I'd love to hear more about the time and the frame of your podcast and what the whole concept is. Yeah, so we have two podcasters, one around, uh, again, Prospera Women, 
um, that's going to launch in February to coincide with the next co cohort. Uh, and then uh, I have another one called uh, Future Construct. And it's primarily focused on the AEC, so architecture, engineering, and construction industry uh, and technology. Although we really have a very broad range of very interesting guests and it's, it's more just around sort of future technology and what the opportunity is to uh, you know, make our work and our personal lives better using tech. So Future Construct, that's on all the podcast stations, uh, you know, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, and then look for Prospera Women podcast again on, on those uh, starting in February. Sounds good. And uh, LJ, what about yourself? Tell a little bit about what your shows are and where folks can find them. LJ, can you hear me? She may have stepped she away. She might be frozen. Hopefully she's refreshing. <laughs> refreshing and all of that. I do know that that sometimes happens. So hopefully she's refreshing and she'll come back and tell us a little bit more about the podcast. Um, is there a place that you, you earlier mentioned that you had traveled around the world, Amy, and everything. Is there a place that you would love to go that you haven't been to yet that's on your wish list and everything? A place that you would like to uh see uh that you haven't gone to because i know that you've probably been to i've got a friend that did the whole cruising thing and they've been all over the world and uh, visited several countries and all but i was just curious is there a place that you haven't been to yet well there's two um i want to go to uh bali and and tahiti so it's sort of island beachy sort of relaxed um i had a friend who's uh he's a digital nomad uh, and he was in Bali for three months and he came back and he was like a new person. So I said, all right, I have to, I definitely have to go there. Uh, and then I have a friend who has some property on um, Tahiti and it's just, it looks magical. So those are two places. I typically go to pretty big cities mostly because I go to conferences and, you know, uh, and events. So I want to go a little more off the beaten path. No, there's nothing wrong with going off to beat the past. Actually, one of the places that I've uh, wanted to go to myself for a while is a good friend of mine is a professor over at Central, North Carolina Central University, and he took several of his students for a couple of trips to Belize. They had like a little oh, trade yeah. kind of agreement and everything. And this was several uh, years ago. It was definitely before the pandemic and everything. But I've always said that I wanted to go to Belize and or Colombia or Brazil or a number of those other kind of South American countries. And then I've definitely got friends from Zimbabwe and Kenya. So they're on my list as well as Australia. But unfortunately, I've not done enough world travel. I did uh, world travel as a baby, went to Turkey when I was a infant and then i went on my first cruise about three years ago which included going to like the grand turks and puerto rico and the virgin islands oh, yeah. so i need to do more global travel just in general you've got me much beat in the sense of <laughs> global travel and all of that but one of the things i found back, really come back. Have the opportunity. To, LJ to learn more about her podcast but one of the things i found fascinating and we were talking about how technology has helped us grow and connect with people and we do want to be there in person, but I have become a uh, a fan of a show called Daybreakers. And it's basically the dance community that does like the whole dance kind of things. They usually would do them in big cities like Brazil, New York, California, and all of that. But when the pandemic started, they started doing these global dance parties. So you would get your TV, get your Zoom, and you could make a perfect fool of yourself because I am not a dancer. So I make a perfect <laughs> fool of myself trying to get my dance grooves on while having the fun of that particular event. So I think that they took a brief break, but I think they're coming back in February and they've actually had celebrities on the show as well. I think they might've had um, like uh, Gloria Gaynor might've been on one of the shows and a couple of other folks like that that they've had. So it's always fascinating getting involved in these kind of virtual reality things that are out there that are uh, pulling you out of your comfort zone. Cause like I said, I am definitely not a dancer. <laughs> Well, we've got to um, get you a, a, an Oculus Quest 2 headset, and uh, and then you can do some of the VR dance parties. It's a really okay, fun. Okay, that sounds wonderful. I have to check those out. Um, LJ, um, I was asking you about the podcast, and a little bit of you could tell us a little bit about your uh, shows that you've got going on. Um, my main show, Purely Pop Show, is, of course, on Facebook and social media, YouTube, um my website, purelypositiveshow.com, as well as um, LinkedIn, I post the links there, um, Pinterest, Twitter, and other places. Um, my podcast is on real life. Unfortunately, 
uh, because of my MS, I became very ill last year and I had to stop that. It was too much. And not being able to start it back. That's not all the time. But that is in the work. However, I will take this time to announce that I'm going to be starting a show for Study Arts. Um, arts and that will start um, on other social media channels. Um, so I will be looking for people to be interested in being on the show. I'll put that out there in a Cool. Sounds like it's good. <laughs> um, and that everything. That's everything. Cool. So, um, and how can folks find out about the uh, and reach you if they're interested in uh, being a guest on your show? You can go to Purely Positive Show at G- uh, I can't even talk. Purely Show at Gmail dot com. You can send me an email or. You can hit me up on the website, purelypositiveshow.com. You can um, contact me on Facebook or Instagram under Purely Positive Show, and certainly on LinkedIn under Purely Positive Show. That's it. Cool. Sounds great. Definitely sounds like it should be some great conversation and everything. Um, Amy, what are some of the things that you are uh did you think that you mentioned some of them, but what are some of the other things that we can expect to see coming down the pike over the next several years in that world of virtual reality and in that world of XR that uh, you may not have mentioned so far? You definitely mentioned some of the things that we can expect in the sense of um, concerts and the athletic fields and everything. But whether it's teaching or whether it's a number of other fields out there, what are some of the things that you think we can expect to see in the near future? Yeah, and you alluded a little bit to, you know, vocational training. Um, we're seeing with with training an interesting shift where people are looking more just to learn the specific skills they need for a particular job or career, as opposed to just going and, and you know, going to 50 or $100,000 in debt to get a liberal arts degree. Um, you can now really you know, kind of hone in your skill set. And so what uh, virtual reality is going to allow and augmented reality as well is going to allow is that you can learn some of these skills uh, in these in a sort of modular fashion. So you learn a set of skills for one particular that sort of early stage of your career. And then you'll be able to see what's the next layer of skills I need then to move up or to move into a management path or to move into an entrepreneurship track. Uh, and so that I think will will be it's going to take you know the next decade for that to happen. But those you know skill based modules are available today, and there are some companies that are that are working in that space. So again, you know if you're interested, you can hit me up on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to share with you some of those resources. Sounds great. And for those that are watching, and we've actually had this conversation, Scarlett um, Arcana, I believe is her last name, is one of the main people that's connected with the international broadcast media. And she's actually out of um, Florida and the art uh, basal movement and everything. But not everybody that's watching knows the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. So if you can give like the thumbnail version as to the difference, because I oftentimes hear those terms thrown out there and I know that they are not necessarily the same thing. And the same with artificial intelligence, which I know also gets thrown in that conversation as well. Yeah. So, so virtual reality is when you're in, you've probably seen those big, you know, block headsets and you can't see your surroundings. So you're in a total virtual environment. So if you look up, uh, for example, Oculus Quest 2 or Pico, P-I-C-O, uh, interactive.com, they have virtual reality headsets uh, that you wear and that put you into a full virtual environment. And Quest 2 is a, is a consumer product and it's becoming more affordable. I think they have one now that's uh, $299, um, which is you know, still expensive, but it's a lot less than the $1,000 when they came out. Um, and then augmented reality right now, like if you're using your mobile phone and you buy something on Amazon and it says, show me this in your room, that's augmented reality where you can sort of see a sofa. Pokemon Go is an example of augmented reality, but that's gonna get much, much better and we will have these glasses are coming out in the next couple of years. Apple has a set. Facebook has a set. There's, there's uh, Lenovo just announced theirs. Uh, there's a company in Florida called Magic Leap. Um, they're more focused on business. 
Um, but these magic wayfarers, so a lot of the things you do on your mobile device today, you'll be able to do using your glasses. So if you've ever seen like a heads up display, if you've gotten a rental car, or you have a car that has a heads up display on your windshield, it's similar, right? So you'll be able to say, oh, you know, how do I get to X, Y, and Z restaurant from here? And you'll see a little path, you know, Google's already enabled this. You'll see a little path and it'll show you where you need to go. Um, and that's sort of the early version um, but later, basically everything you do on your mobile device, you'll be able to do using these wearables. And so the whole world will be your screen. Oh, well, well I'm waiting for the uh, self-driving car because I actually have dysgraphia, which is like a form of dyslexia. So me and left and right are not the best of friends. That's part of the reason of running a little bit late to get this show started and everything because I had been on the mass transit and those lovely things called buses. So I'm waiting for y'all to be, get the augmented reality and the artificial intelligence and whatever else you need to get to get either the flying car or the uh, self-driving car. That way I can just jump in it and go where I need to go. So that's uh, how far soon, that's I, coming soon. You're going to get your wish. <laughs> is, is that coming soon? It, it is coming soon. It is coming soon. Even Apple is purportedly doing uh, a self-driving car, but we'll see. Um, but Tesla's made great strides um, with their self-driving vehicles, uh, and they also have trucks on the road now. And, and now it's just a matter of the city's building the infrastructure because it's going to require its own lane to start because you can't really have you know drivers sort of mixing it up with autonomous vehicles yet. Yeah. Um, but but it's there's a, a number of municipalities who are are working on it very aggressively. So I'm good. So I'll be keeping that in mind because, like I said, maybe before I hit it, because I'm late 50s now, so maybe before 70, I'll be able to get in the car and the car can take me to where I've got to go and everything. So hopefully within the next 12 years. So definitely, maybe before definitely. <laughs> so hopefully that will happen and I will be a glad person and everything. Amy, one of the things I know that science fiction people talk about is this fear of um, – maybe giving too much autonomy to the computer world and all of that. So when you hear those kind of science fiction tales and people being a little bit too concerned about us having too many things that are electronic or um, technology-based, whether that's the microwave, and I'm actually standing in my microwave right now and everything, or the drones, because I've actually got a drone plane that I think I've flown once, but I need to fly it more often. But what is, is these different tools that we have and everything, what is your reaction when you hear people have that complaint about where we're going technology-wise? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of negativity and there's a lot of negative aspects, um, you know, to some technology. But I'd also argue that, you know, it's it's one of the ways that we're able to stay connected. And we talked a little bit earlier about how kids are sort of resilient, right? And we have, you know, this next generation of kids are full digital natives. And so for them, it's perfectly normal, right? And, you know, it's it's a matter of perspective. I actually get people that ask me all the time, like, what happens if, you know, your virtual life is better than your real life and you just spend all your time in a virtual world? And it's not it's not sort of a binary problem. It's it's much more complex than that. But it it's almost like well, things are going to be different. Like technology, we are going to merge with technology. I would argue we already have merged with technology to a large degree. But what the important thing is is for us, and this is why steam is so important, is while we still have control of the technology, we need to envision what we want our futures to look like and not, you know, I hear people every year at the beginning of every year, we just heard, oh, these are my predictions for the year. Yeah. And, you know, there's a quote by Alan Kay, it's also been attributed to, to Abraham Lincoln, but it was Alan Kay, that says the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so yeah. I would urge all of us to tap into that creativity and decide what it is we want out of technology? What do we want our futures to look like? What do we want our legacy with our children, our grandchildren to be? And let's build that future. Like we actually have the power to do that, right? And to change outcomes. Uh, so that's, you know, again, it's a lot to think about, but mm -hmm. I think we all have a part to play. And that's why I love what LJ is doing. You know, it's like, it, LJ is out there putting a smile on everybody's face. And mm -hmm. that's really hard to do. But she said, I'm going to do it. And she did it. And so if everybody did something like that, it doesn't have to be what LJ is doing. It doesn't have to be what I'm doing or what you're doing, but do something that is impacting the world in a positive way and make that the norm. 
of everyday life. And we will be able to change outcomes. Yeah, we definitely need to be able to change outcomes and everything. Now, I will say that it did throw me off. I think it was either last year or the year before when I got a uh, telephone call and everything. And it was from my nephew. And like I said, he was about, I uh, think he was the uh, older one. So at that time, he was probably 11. And I'm sitting there going like, because I think he called me up and he was like, is, uh, I think he might have even said his uncle Mark there, his uncle Mark there and everything. And I'm sitting there kind of like stunned, like who is, who is calling me at this got this kid's voice and everything. Cause I was not used to having this voice calling me with their own phone. Cause he had his own phone. And I think that his younger brother has their own phone as well. So I don't know about you, LJ, but I don't think that I got a phone till I was like maybe a teenager or things of that nature. I know I did not have one at age 10 or age 11. <laughs> it seems like our kids now are getting these phones at a younger and younger age. I've even heard of babies that are having their own phones and everything, like maybe not quite babies, but two or three-year-olds and things of that nature. So you're a grandma and everything. So um, LJ, have you had some of your folks in your family that have been given these phones at a very early age, and how have you been coping with that? Look, my nine-year-old son has, and this is amazing, has a laptop for school. He has a tablet. He's had it for years. He just got a new iPhone. <laughs> and he has all these games and all these gadgets and stuff. That's the nine-year-old. He's month old. I said he is 18, so I can't stand a word he says. But he has a phone and a tablet. And I'm like, why does he have a tablet? And my daughter says, it's because he understands what he's doing. So I, I, I put up my laptop. That little boy walked over, turned my laptop around so he could see what was going on on the laptop. Trying to type because his mom works from home and he watches her do this all the time. I'm like, this is amazing. He's eight months old. So, yeah, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Yeah, it's amazing seeing these kids that are working these phones, working these tablets, and things of that nature. And Amy, you brought up another point and everything, because I am wondering if, to some degree, we're kind of, uh, I mean, I love the technology, and I'm a big fan of the technology, but I sometimes feel that it's, on the negative side, it gets us to lose a little bit of that human interaction, and sometimes it becomes too much of a um, tool to, like, even kind of, like, um, alter even some of our social norms and everything. Like, I don't know that, and I'll just put it out there, I'm an old man at 58, so I can actually say this and everything, but I don't know that dating will ever be the same, because we got so many folks that are into that old <laughs> gender mentality and all of that, so like I said, I don't know that it's ever going to be the same, because they're sitting there doing the whole swipe left, swipe, swipe right kind of attitude toward that's just the dating world, and like I said, it seems like it's impacting even that aspect of our lives. Yeah, I have a, I have a joke that, um, you know, my, my kids, uh, you know, are always doing this. And, you know, so I might be talking to them and they're, they're just completely in their little worlds. Uh, but then when the AR glasses come, they'll be able to look up. But, you know, so like over my head will be like, I don't know, the latest episode of Black Mirror and then their text feed will be here and then their Instagram will be here so that at least when they're, you know, ignoring me, they're looking directly at me. Um, but you know, it, it it is a balance and we just have to, you know, as parents, we have to do our best. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, we come from a different era. You know, I, I hate to say that we're the dinosaurs, but in, in some ways, you know, we, we are the ones who have to adapt. Um, kids are, are already, it's just second nature, right? And it's, it's going to be even more so. Um, you know, I, what I what I'd like to see next in sort of the tech realm is for us to have a mechanism to be able to just sort of take our, our data back so that we are, uh, you know, not the product, as, as they say, um, but that we actually have control of our data and that we're able to not only monetize our data, but just, you know, give permissions and access and be more in control of it. Um, it's not going to happen in the short term, but I'd like to see that kind of happening in the long term. And unfortunately, I have a, I'm six minutes past my, my hard stop. No, no problem. <laughs> I, I understand. I'm good. 
I've had a quick question for you, then I'm going to let you bounce. And I've actually, we're getting rid of the whole show up in a very short thing. But my very quick question for you and everything was, do you ever think that we'll get to a point of teaching? Uh, and then I've got a quick statement, to, and I want to hear your statement as well. But um, do you ever think we'll get to the point of getting to tech etiquette? Because that is my other thing that I do see that sometimes goes on. And we talked about it on this show, as well as on um, one of my audio podcasts and everything, where we'll go to a restaurant back when you could go to a restaurant and have more of the sit down kind of environment. And you'll see uh, two, uh, what is obviously a couple they're sitting there, but they're both on their uh, devices communicating to whoever knows they're communicating to, but they're not communicating to their individuals that they're there with, whether that's a husband, wife, whether that's boyfriend, girlfriend, or whatever. So do you think they will ever get to the point of actually like having courses in tech etiquette? Cause sometimes that's what I want. I want like a course in tech etiquette. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's very true. And we're seeing that in virtual environments as well. There was an environment, I sh I'm actually not, I'm not going to say the name, but um, there was one environment um, and, and you know, you'd, you'd go in and people would like jump on your head and do all sorts of like very, very weird things. Um, and yeah, I think we need to just as a society put demands on our, you know, circle of friends and family. I, I don't allow my, my kids to have even now uh, you know, to have their cell phone at the dinner table. Like this is our time to sit and talk and, you know, look each other in the eye. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, it's going to be a balance. Um, but again, I think it's up to us to decide what those boundaries are uh, in the bigger picture. There's a lot of companies working on sort of the standards so that they're like behaviors that are, um, p you know, potentially disruptive or, uh, inflammatory or negative towards another, you know, person or another group of people, um, that 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 will not be allowed to happen, and there'll be mechanisms in place. But on that personal level, it's really us to, uh, up to us to kind of define what those boundaries are and what is socially acceptable. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that you should not be sitting with a person and then both of you on your phone talking to other people. That sort of negates the point of being together. Um, but maybe the pandemic has been a good lesson for that. Where it's yep. like you'll, so. you'll respect the fact that now we get to be together. Yep, definitely. And then the question I was going to ask, and it's the same thing that I asked uh, the other guests that had to leave it as well early, was um, I always try to give on all my platforms the opportunity for the guests to share their message of positivity that they would like to share to the world. So I would love to hear yours, Amy, before you get ready to run off and conquer the world of tech. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's just, you know, this has been a great moment for us to all think about what's important to us. And I think most of us realize that it's family and friends and, and those sort of human connections. And so I'm hoping that everyone comes out of this, um, you know, and I, and I hate to, to bash an, an app that I, that I do actually like and use next door, um, which is a great app for connecting communities, but it's also become this big kind of complain fest where someone will, you know, have like a 20 inches, you know, which on screen is pretty long about how somebody didn't get their order right at Starbucks, right? And I'm just thinking this is small thought, right? This isn't helping us be better. And so I would just urge everyone to kind of take this, all the, you know, soul searching they've been doing and go out and just see, you know, follow LJ's lead, do something positive, just even if it's one small thing a day that impacts somebody positively, um, say something nice to someone. Like it's amazing when you just say something nice to someone and they smile and it, it just, it changes them for the next five, 10, 15, whatever it is, 20 minutes. Um, but it changes those 20 minutes and it makes them happy. And so, yeah, I think, I think we all need to, to really, um, just be better people and be nicer to one another. <laughs> Seems simple, but I think that's what we need. No, I definitely agree with you. And I appreciate you being on. You're an amazing guest. And like I told, um, and I always tell all my guests, I would love to have you come back on whenever you're available. And I will definitely be taking you up on any opportunities that you've got to share with us, the gaming people for the gamers den, as well as any other guests that you have that you would like to share on this platform or a number of our other shows as well, but I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and hopefully we'll get a chance for you to come back and share some more wisdoms of what's going on in VR, AR, and whatever else you find out on a regular basis or whenever you have something that you would love to share. Um, you're always welcome to come back. Thank you so much, Mark. And LJ, it's a pleasure to meet you. Bye.
Take care. Cool. So uh, that's uh, LJ. We just got a few more minutes and everything, but I would love to hear um, just some of your thoughts about uh, what's going on in the world and how you're coping with everything that's going on in the world and just how you're dealing on a day-to-day basis. We know that last week was a rough week. We actually talked about that on one of my shows yesterday because um, we had um, my friend Zach had Bill Tresbond as well as um, a lady out of Cincinnati. And we were just talking about just the ways that uh, what's going on in the world and how we're trying to keep a positive attitude. Cause a lot of times with all the negativity, it's easy to fall into those negative traps, but you seem to be doing a great job of not falling into those traps. So I would love to find out how you cope with all the negative things that you hear from social media and from the world of the news. Well, my way is probably uh, unconventional simply because um, we're bombarded 24 seven with news and being bombarded with that is largely a negative thing. So my workaround is to only watch the news once a day. Um, Mm -hmm. Choose which, whether it's going to be in the morning or at night. um, And I don't watch any more during the day. Um, I get my main news and then that's it. I make sure that I'm not reading a bunch of news stories online and that I'm not um, constantly putting myself in a situation where I'm having this shoved down my throat and thrown at me all the time. Now, for me, that's important because, like I told you, I'm a book of the war. I get very emotional with um, the things that I see and things that I hear. So for that reason, um, I have to limit my exposure and I have to limit those things that I'm listening to. And that works for me. If I get an alert, then I know it's important. I glance at it. If it's something that I really need to read, then yeah, I'll go other than that. I table it until a later time and that's it. And that's how I cope with all this negativity around us. That is um, quite the opposite of, say, for instance, my husband. He is a news hound 24-7, bam, 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 all the time. That's exactly what he does. He has to see that all the time. He has to keep up with everything all the time. So for that reason, I think, I have taken the complete opposite approach to it because I know if it's something that I really need to know, he's going to tell me anyway, and then I don't have to worry about it. But that's how I cope with everything, and that works. Um, It makes life easier for me. It makes it easier for me to be happier because my motto is being positive is a choice. Make it the best choice that you can. So it's easy for me to be able to do that because I don't focus on all of the stuff around me. I know the pandemic here, so forth and so on, but I just don't make it the focus of my life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and that's a great attitude to have and everything of that nature. You had mentioned earlier at the beginning about that one positive case, which was a gentleman in Nigeria and everything. I was just wondering if you could share with our audience a um, positive story that you've had that was from the United States as well as maybe another global one because like I said we are a global network but I'd love to hear maybe some other stories that you've had the pleasure of covering and talking about and maybe one from the United States and another one that's global. I have a um, in the United States wow there's so much there is an associate of mine who has a company called Infinity Essentials She makes natural body products, and she does the essential oil. She uses shea butter, so forth and so on. Turn that business into, um, she has different levels of business. Let me say it that way. She does um, meals to people. So if you want to start a farm, all organic fruits and vegetables, um, Eventually, she wants to get big enough to where she will actually have animals fed there as well, you know, grass-fed animals. She also has a um, a segment of it called Infinity Dope, where she uses CBD oil in her natural products because of the healing properties that are associated with the endocannabinoid system in the, in the body. 
So she is my she is my United States of America um, other favorite story. And okay. my other international story would be um, a guy in Nigeria, <laughs> ironically. He has a children's network. He helps children and they are a national and like organization. They are a nonprofit and they work with different organizations to help social education and safety for children, mainly safety for children and teaching children um, how to be safe. So he was on the show, I think in season three, I think it was season three, we're in season six. So, and I can't pronounce his name, so I call him Mr. O. Because <laughs> his name is difficult to pronounce. But if you go to purelyhottishow.com, and if you look at season three, you'll see him on there. <laughs> okay, cool. Definitely sounds like some great stories and everything along those lines. And it's always great, like Amy was saying, that you're able to share these stories of positivity and all of that, because we definitely need more stories of positivity just on a regular basis because we hear so many of the negative stories and of course there's all kinds of negativity not just in the news but also in uh movies and in music and everything of that nature so you're definitely able to show people that there are positive and highlighting stories out there that are definitely wonderful to uh be uh seen and all of that so definitely that's a great thing to have happen and all of that so definitely appreciate your sharing those words of positivity. And like I told all the other guests and everything, um, I always love to have our, my guests give their message of positivity as we're going to wind down in a few more minutes. And I've got a couple of other ads of some of our other shows that exist and that I'll run on to end the show and everything. But definitely if you could share your words of positivity and words of encouragement, I'd love to hear those. Okay. First, I would like to thank you, Mark, so much for having me on the show. That's the first thing. The second thing is, like I said, being positive is a choice. You have a choice as to whether or not you're going to say something negative or whether or not you're going to say something positive or your actions. So make it the very best choice that you can. Take something small, something very small, like Amy says, something as small as saying hello or have a nice day or you have a beautiful smile or that color looks great on you. Something really small someone's day. You never know what someone is going through or how that will impact them, like she said, for the next 15 to 20 minutes or even for the whole day. You just never know. So make that choice. Make it a positive choice and make it the best choice that you can. Um, Because all of us, if we all do one positive thing, then we'll all have a global effect on everybody else if we're all doing it. Yeah, that's very true. We gotta have that global effect, and I definitely need to have that global message of positivity because we're all in this uh, globe together. And I think too often we find ways to divide ourselves, whether that's dividing people on um, race, on nationalities, on religion, on a number of other things that we find to divide ourselves. But at the end of the day, we're all in this thing together and we need to have an understanding that it is a global community and that we need to have that kind of global attitude and not try to find the dividing factors. I find that too often we concentrate on those dividing factors when we need to be concentrated on the unifying factors. Exactly. 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 I agree 100%. Yeah. Definitely. Well, like I said, it was great having you on the show and everything, so I'm going to let you go. I know you said you had an appointment, and I'm going to show a couple of ads from our television shows that exist, and then I've got to do one more show here on the international broadcast media, but having you as well as my other two guests was an amazing experience. I enjoyed all of y'all's conversation, and I think that y'all added some great uh, insight into a number of things that are very important, whether it's... um, things around health, whether it's things around augmented reality, whether it's things just around being positive. But I thought that y'all all brought some amazing conversation in, and I greatly appreciate you being on as well as my other two guests. So definitely look forward to having you, like I said, to the other ladies. Hope that you'll be able to come back on in the near future and share the different things that you're doing, because definitely would love to have you come back on whenever you're available. Thank you so much. I will definitely do that, and I'll keep in touch. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Sounds great. So like I said, she's off and everything. So she's got her appointment and I definitely appreciate her being on the show and 
she definitely shared a lot of great wisdom and all of that. Definitely, if you go back and you catch the uh, beginning of the show, you'll hear about um, the uh, children's uh, flight program and all of that. And I thought that that lady was an amazing lady. And, of course, we did have the lady that was talking about augmented reality as well. So definitely some great conversations as we often have here on the radio show with Mark Lee. So definitely appreciated all of my amazing guests. And uh, don't forget that go over there and check out Mullins Music and Memories. That'll be the show coming your way at four o'clock. That's right. That's the show coming on at four o'clock. So definitely uh, look forward to all of that and look forward to some great conversations going on with a number of folks. As a matter of fact, somebody was putting some hashtags out that we can use for what's going on in the world and all of that. So that's some of the hashtags that you can use for this particular show. So I definitely appreciate folks checking us out and learning about the different things that we've got going on, including some great programming that exists right here on our network. So we're going to bring up some of those uh, spots about that great programming that exists here so that y'all can check that out and learn more about some of our other amazing shows that exist here on our network, um, the international broadcast and media. So definitely I'm hoping that y'all will check out some of these shows. One of them is my good friend, the Sasha show. So check that out. He's over there in Canada, but he talks both about investments and about chess. So let's see what he's got to say about investments first.
My name's Brandon. I'm a world traveler, foodie, and YouTuber. Together, you and I will find the best travel hacks, tips, and best places to explore. Join me as we find new adventures together, live only on IBM.TV. Just some of the amazing shows that exist right here on IVM TV. That's right, the international broadcast media. And definitely those were some great shows as well as some great conversations that we had and all of that. So definitely want to thank my guests for being on the show. Here to wrap up another edition of the radio show with Mark Lee. And you're ready to bring y'all on Mullins Music and Memories very shortly. So that'll be our show that'll be coming up as well. But right now, let's wrap up the show with our theme song. Just, 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 just. 